So, imagine a thing with human faces, what a treat and a delight. Um, I get to stand up, not worry about being on mute, and, and get to use my clicker and everything. It's actually quite exciting. So, elephant in the room, policy is a super dull thing. It's kind of hard to make it sexy, but I'm going to at least try and get your attention. So, bear with me. So, to set the scene, I'm in a lift, and yes, any American friends, we really do call them lifts, and four people walk in. I think to myself, Chris, this is your moment, now or never. As the doors close, I position myself in front of them, a captive audience. They're mine. I've got them. The doors seal shut behind me, and I take a breath. I look to the first person on my left. She's in a suit. She looks really important to her. I gesture to her. See? She looks back at me as if to say, yes, go on. I, she nods, oh, ah, perfect, the CIO, the policymaker, the one whose neck is on the block. What are the chances of finding you in my imaginary lift today? I ask her, well, what keeps you up at night? She tells me, I don't know what teams are really doing what, the volume of risk and what I should be showing more interest in. Setting and changing policy is slow, hard to communicate, and people just go off and do their own thing. They think they know better, and to be honest, often they do, but then I'm left playing catch-up with the risk that they've signed me up to. Okay, I say, trying not to sound like a patronising snake, yeah, patronising snake oil salesman, I can help. I turn my attention to the second person, in a suit, slightly less important though, I make a guess, let's face it, this is my imagination, it'd be a bit weird if I was wrong. Product manager, I say, and they nod. Ah, the whip cracker. What's important to you? So managing risk, mostly opportunity risk, the fear of missing out. So getting features out the door and avoiding getting bogged down with, they glance to the CIO, bureaucracy that is designed almost seemingly to just to slow me down. Awesome, I say, this is your lucky day. I turn to the next person, dressed in overalls. I'm in a trendy part of town. They could be the CTO. Before I ask, they sense me staring at them. Cleaner, they say, huh. Odd, how did you get in my imagination? I'll, I'll come back to you. My attention goes to the last person. Uh, hoodie, headphones around their neck. Ah, my stereotypical developer. Yes, I know you well. What code do you write, I ask? It doesn't really matter. Python, cool. Have you got anything to work, uh, updated to work with? I pause. Python 3, they offer? Yes, Python 3. That must have been super hard. They don't know it, but I kind of almost won a bit of their trust. What's important to you? Um, so staying on top of patching things so we can react to the next fire, knowing what rules exist, what ones I can bend, what I can break, and ultimately what might cause me to lose my job. Writing consistent, good quality code and avoiding technical debts. Ultimately, the rest of my team being able to cohesively work as one. Do you use any tools to help you with that, I ask? So, yeah, linters, code quality, test coverage, the, the kind of usual. Great, I say. I write code too. Let's be friends, and I hand them a printed QR code. Here's my public GPG key, so you know that you can trust what I say. I return my focus to the cleaner. I've got it. How do you get told what to do and when it changes? Well, we get a memo or something stuck to a notice board. So last week we got a memo saying that all of the meeting room whiteboards needed to be cleaned every night. Interesting, I say. Well, how does that work out? Well, it's then up to us to then maintain the to-do list so that we can onboard new people and such. Does it go wrong at all? So yeah, sometimes if we compile that operational manual wrong when we miss a memo or don't apply them in sequence, we do, things do go wrong. They glance apologetically to the product manager, like when we hadn't updated the guide that the meeting room on the third floor was being used as a dedicated war room, and we wiped all their boards down. I look to the dev. Does that sound familiar, I ask? They nod. So, turns out we're not all that special snowflakes, hey? Okay, all's not lost. I knew that there was a reason that I imagined you here today. The lift is slowing. I feel it coming towards its destination. Great, I've got the silver bullet for you too. The CIO looks ready to buy literally whatever it is I'm selling. They ask me as the doors open, who are you and what team are you in? As I move out of the way so to stop obstructing it, uh, I answer, I don't actually work here. I'm just here to fix the lift. People have been complaining that it actually goes to the top floor and it's actually pretty slow. My audience storms out, furious, heading towards the stairs and the doors shut and I get back to my job. Okay. So if any of that might sound vaguely familiar and you can relate to my imaginary friends, then I might have something resembling answers for you. So what if I said you could update policy easily, even releasing several version updates, not just in a year, a month, what about 10 updates in a single day, and seamlessly communicate that to the people that need to consume it without derailing them. You could have visibility on compliance using tools that perhaps you already use. And that policy could be readily consumable, easy to pass, demonstrate compliance, and make sense and not be bureaucratic to change when it needs to, and ultimately not get in the way. That same policy could be treated as a dependency, 
and operate like a linter. So you could run compliance checks locally in CI and then guard production. That multiple versions of the policy, like a dependency, are supported. So emergencies like you must update now because there's now some known vulnerability type updates effectively just become a business as usual activity to carry out within your business. Interesting? Okay, hang around. Um, hopefully I'm about doing for time. I wasn't allowed to lock the doors, but this would have been the point that I would have allowed them to be unlocked. So, hopefully I've at least got your attention. It's, it's now time to kind of introduce myself and start explaining things. So, my name's Chris Nesbitt-Smith. Uh, I'm currently an instructor for Learn K8 and also for Control Plane, uh, consultant to uh, UK government at the minute, the Crown Prosecution Service, uh, and generally a tinkerer of open source stuff. Um, I've spent a fair chunk of my professional career now working in kind of UK Gov and large organisations where problems like this are rife. Uh, we should have some time at the end for questions and heckles, so please kind of prepare a really good one. Um, and I've got t-shirts for the best questions, so think of a really good one. If not, I've got pink trousers, I, you won't miss me, um, so find me afterwards somewhere. So, given that I've got the luxury of a live audience, and most of you have got clothes on for a change, thank you. So, by show of hands, who's with my CIO and has set, written, or applied some policy in any sort of guise before? Any sort of coding standards or anything like that? Cool. Almost all of you. Okay, thanks. You can put your hands down. Now, how many of you have sought exemption or, or consciously bent, broken, circumvented, ignored, bypassed, whatever, a policy with at least good intentions? <laughs> cool, you fell for it. But so thanks to the organisers of this event and now the photographic evidence, I've got all of your names and employers' details down, so can I put your phones down, lend me your ears, the stakes just got raised. So, where do I see policy as code going wrong? Well, before we dig into that, what do I mean by policy? So it usually comes in one of two forms. So security enforcing, so like data at rest being encrypted, for example, or consistency, such as code style, so tabs being two or four space indentated maybe. Or maybe you can think of some others, but in any case, it's hopefully intended to mitigate a risk of some sort. However, with the best of intentions, these are often emotionally led rather than being grounded in a proportionate control, which is the open door to case-by-case -case exemptions being sought uh, when you come against a situation that you weren't expecting. So this is not unlike uh, how the laws of the land were created. So with case law making for a complex to navigate rulebook and harder still to measure compliance. It often can look like the thin end of a wedge where the precedent, which may have been an uncomfortable pill to swallow the first time round, becomes dangerous with others looking to expand upon its scope. Which can lead us to sometimes wonder if the cure was actually worse than the disease. But that's not how we at least typically develop software, so why does this all have to be so hard? We codified everything else, so maybe this is the answer. Well, yes in part, but my point of this talk is that we often do it wrong. So maybe some of you are kind of mentally screaming your favourite product name at me in your heads, and it's not, uh, and it's not, and you're not wholly wrong. But the devil's in the detail. Throwing some curly braces or YAML at something doesn't inherently fix things. If it's a security control, it's often tempting to keep that policy a secret. Exposing it could maybe be used against you by an adversary. However, that does not support us kind of shifting left at all. It results in devs effectively reverse engineering what the policy is by finding out when we can smash our heads up against it. It doesn't therefore take much imagination to see that in the scenario of an application deploy, uh, finding one resource is non-compliant and rejected would leave us the overall deploy in an inconsistent state, likely resulting in some downtime. Which begs the question of was the policy better than the downtime that you uh, incurred? Especially if that leads your engineers, who are all hopefully plenty smart people at finding inventive ways, should we say, around the computer says no response that they've got. This is then further exasperated when updates to the policy are desired. So maybe you get a pen test or something goes wrong. So you form that case law effectively and need to apply a new policy. So maybe say all S3 buckets now need to be encrypted, a change that could be considered breaking. Sure, you might say that you provide, say, warnings on at least the, the less important issues or, or new emerging policy, which is great so long as someone sees them. But if you've adopted GitOps or at least CI, CD in some fashion, 
Is anyone seeing any of those warnings? I mean, who studies the results of a successful build log every time? Anyone? Every time? <laughs> well, if you are, <laughs> I'd politely suggest you're perhaps missing the point of CICD. You should ultimately be able to trust your job status. OK, well, I'm not here just to throw stones. So remember my implied promises to my four imaginary friends of what this utopia might look like. Well, there's nothing new under the sun here, funnily enough. We've already unwittingly solved these problems elsewhere. We just need to be reminded and join the dots. Well, the first is something that if you're doing policy as code, you're probably already doing. So put it in version control. The thing, however, you might not be doing then is making that visible. So at least in a source set by which I mean allow anyone within your walled garden of employees and suppliers and etc to see the policy. I'm not saying kind of give away all your kind of threat intel and monitoring rules, rules away. You can probably keep that all to yourself. But I'd argue that visible policy and the gaps therein is often better than the downtime, reverse engineered workarounds and opaque legacy exem exemption spaghetti soup. If you're brave, you might even open source it. You'll find that it unlocks the ability to work well with prospective suppliers without NDAs and whatnot. And ultimately, widely distributed secrets are expensive to maintain, difficult to handle, and often only stay secret for so long after all. OK, so we're off to a good start. Our policy is visible now to those that need to see it. So many of you are no doubt used to Semver, but a quick recap. So the first segment for it is to indicate breaking changes. So perhaps conflicting ones. So in the context of policy, let's say it's requiring resources to have a department label. Maybe that will help with some internal cross-charging. Who knows? I'm not really judging. An increment to that might look like requiring that to be from a predetermined list rather than free text. The second segment is to indicate minor changes that shouldn't really break anyone. An increment to that might look like uh, correcting a spelling mistake on one of the department names. The third is to indicate patch changes, so these should be a no-brainer for everyone to keep up to date with. An increment to that might look like, say, adding a department to the list of available options. OK, our policy is visible in a repository, its versions, so that we can easily communicate the policy, we can tack on release notes, and expectations are managed by semantic versioning. In software, we're used to handling dependencies. So, what if your policy was just another dependency? So you might unwittingly already be doing this if, for example, you have, say, ESLint as a dependency in your JavaScript package, perhaps. OK, so our policy is visible in a repository. It's versioned. We can easily communicate the policy. We can tack on the notes. We can expectations are managed by Semver. It's beginning to look a lot more like software. OK, I know testing is a dirty word, but in order to make this an asset that can, everyone can depend on and also provide some really useful known good examples, Tests are essential to give everyone confidence and stability and surface potential side effects before they end up hurting everyone involved. Consumers of this policy need to be able to test themselves against the policy locally and in CICD, thus shortening the feedback loop and better informing things. So as a bonus, we should be able to find our consumers able to rely on the artifact that we're sharing with them. OK, we're well and truly on the home stretch. It's a dependency, so updating it should be no different to any other. And we can even use some magic like GitHub's Dependable or Mend, who were downstairs earlier, Renovate, uh, to do some of that for us. So think automatic pull requests, tests, even auto-merging if you're brave. OK, to check you're all still awake, can anyone tell me a recent event that caused everyone to want to know what version of a certain Java logging doohickey we were potentially <laughs> running literally everywhere in the estate? Bingo. So yeah, as you know, all presentations this year are actually contractually to, required to reference Log4j, even when it's almost entirely out of context, and includes some memes. In just a few short months, I can remove these, and hopefully just point broadly at a scary-looking list of CVEs in order to command your behaviour through fear. What I'm getting at here, though, is, is that situational awareness piece around software supply chain is something that your organisation is already kind of hopefully thinking about if not already addressing. So if our policy is a dependency, this is not a new problem. So software bill of materials for the win, right? Which can allow us to also then measure the compliance across the entire estate. OK, I've just covered quite a lot of ground and hopefully sounded at least vaguely convincing and it's not just a fictional utopia painted in PowerPoint. It's time to look at how you might be actually able to do this and I know you really came here wanting to see a million words on a slide and not just the odd emoji or two. 
So we've reached the point of the show where I get to show you some code. Hooray! But to maintain scope, I'm going to limit this to talking about two things to prove this is not just one tech or one tool. I've arbitrarily picked Terraform and Kubernetes, but I could have probably picked anything. Naturally, I'll need some tools to help me go, uh, go with this. I'm too lazy to invent that much here. So likewise, I'm going to pick two tools. But again, I could have used some or even all, perhaps. Um, so in this case, uh, Chekhov's going to be doing my Terraform, uh, whereas Caverno is going to be doing my Kubernetes. If you want to browse along with me, um, the link will be at the end of the deck as well, but um, I'm not expecting you to kind of read or grok the code on screen, so don't worry about it. It's just to prove that I made something that's vaguely real. So the policy is stored here. Uh, so here's where my policy starts, uh, it's v1.00. So I've got policy that requires that department label on all resources. So long as it's set, doesn't matter what it is. I've written tests for this, so note how the passing test cases are a really useful, great example of what good and bad can look like. We pushed a tag in Git, we've added the release notes. I can sign it to provide further assurance if my heart so desires, which of course it does, but moving on. Version two looks similar, only now that department field has to be from a predetermined list. So like before, tests exist, release notes are written, tags are signed. 2.1.0 is where we notice and correct a spelling mistake of one of the options in that list of departments. 2.1.1, and I've now added a new department to list. A couple more repos in that org, the app one and info one, and they depend on version 1.00 of the policy. Excuse me, it's not compliant with version 2.00 or beyond, but how do I know that? Well, I've configured Renovate to be automatically making a pull request. So when there's a new version of the uh, policy, it's super obvious if I can just update the dependency. And I can see clear feedback about where and why I'm not compliant. I can also see all the pull requests over the org, so I can measure the compliance of my policy. Okay, moving on from that, app2, compile repos, so app2 and infra2, well they depend on version 2.00 of the policy. However, we could merge the open pull request all the way up to 2.1.1. Finally, app3 and infra3, another two repos, are dependent on 2.1.1, and they get a gold star from the CIO. There is a small touch of magic, and it's not pretty. I've written some bash. Don't judge me, even though I've probably definitely absolutely constantly written much worse. But what this allows me to do is from my dev laptop or in CI to evaluate my code against the version of the policy that I've declared. Ideally, this might be a bit less cumbersome, but it is what it is for now. Pull requests are very welcome. And the last piece of the puzzle is managing the life cycle of the policies so, and allowing multiple versions of the policy to be accepted and evaluated within a single runtime. I've cheated a bit here. So Kubernetes gives you admission controllers. It's not so easy to gonna get the same policy from a cloud vendor uh, and be able to actually evaluate that about, about stuff that you've got locally. Again, pull requests, contributions, collaboration, all very welcome on that front. So, you may have noticed uh, the way that the policy is declared and designed uh, and distributed lends itself to well to coexist with itself in a Kubernetes cluster. Which brings us to another repo, cluster one, which describes a cluster that accepts all the versions of the repos, uh, all the versions, of the, all the versions that we just, the policy that we described so far. I get the words out. So likewise, another repo, cluster two, only accepts 2.00 and greater. We can automate this uh, all using uh, Kind, which is Kubernetes in Docker for CI, uh, in order to deploy the apps. And there we have it, a full org, all done, all compliant, policy all versioned, and CIO all aware of what's going on. This is great, right? But just one more thing. Wouldn't it be awesome if the policy carried a story about why it exists? After all, if our agile teams are even half effective, they should be rejecting anything that they perceive as friction if they don't see the value in it. And it could allow our devs to know why they're compliant. And if they want to do something outside of what the policy permits, they don't need to have any exemption granted per se. They can have a well-reasoned and informed debate with rationale behind a pull request to the policy. So imagine, if you will, this going through a stage of versions with risks that inform the mitigations manifested as policy, all maintained kind of as one living thing. So when the risk landscape changes, your policies can move with it. So when some new pri uh, privacy regulation comes out or your latest marketing strategy pays off and you acquire more data, for example, even if your policy was perfect at one time, the risk and the appetite for it will stand still for no one. 
So we can liken this to over-provisioning that we might be familiar with from elsewhere. When lead times are long, change is hard, and there is a significant pressure in nailing it the first time, which can lead us to hedging bets against what some future state might be, rather than proportionate mitigation to the risks that are more tangibly real in the now. And that's where the real culture change is needed, and the execution of that is likely a long series of talks in of itself. So now this is really kind of all over to you. Honestly, the best thing that you could do right now is tell me it's madness. Already done, irrelevant, or otherwise just unachievable, something my esteemed echo chamber appears have yet to do. So beyond making some pull requests and developing the theory some more, I'd really like to start building some more case studies with willing kind of real organisations and allow me to continue to swap out my imaginary friends for some real ones. But the most important thing that I want you to remember from our talk together is, and please do feel free to say this out loud with me, purposeless policy is potentially practically pointless policy, which I've been practising far too many times. So. I'm Chris Nose Smith. Thank you so much for your time. You're now free to leave. I'll destroy the evidence of your guilt admissions earlier. Um, like, subscribe, whatever the kids do on LinkedIn, GitHub, whatever. There's, you'll be rest assured that there's no spam or really much content at all since I'm awful at self promotion. Um, CNS.me just points at my LinkedIn, so it's a bit easier than typing my name. Uh, and talks.cns.me contains this uh, and other talks, and they're all open source. Questions, very welcome on this, or anything else, I'll hold the stage for as long as I'm allowed, or find me afterwards. Um, I'll be somewhere where there's some, probably some, uh, some Guinness somewhere, I imagine. Uh, but yeah, thank you very much. I've got t-shirts for the best questions. Um, any comments on exception to policy? In the sense of what sort of scenario are you thinking? Yes. And also with exceptions, because exceptions always come through the policy. You know? Yeah, yeah. So the, the, the point of conversioning it is, uh, and having it in that way is that it should be able to um, be more of a living thing, like our software is, right? So you have a, a requirement for an exemption, exception in the software, you codify that in, so that given this, then that is okay. So rather than just going, fine, that team doesn't need to, apply to comply to a policy, or that team having like a... Uh, a thing around that team or that product or whatever it might be is where you codify that into the actual code so you say well on these conditions and you can have that in a number of ways like you could codify that through like attestation through i don't have any pii therefore i don't need to care about encrypting the bucket i'm just using it as a cheap dirty cdn fine like that that that, that sort of thing and you could uh if you if that was if the org had accepted that it was appropriate to uh, and it was within the risk tolerance to just describe that through kind of metadata annotations on the bucket and apply your policy that way, right? Um, and again, like that's a version increment that you've applied, uh, applied across the org. If that makes sense. Cool. Hello. But they just want to see, like, you know, where is the bottleneck, like, which which is getting fixed frequently. So, is it possible uh, for somebody like that to visualize uh, the statistics or something in a dashboard uh, for this? Yeah, make a pull request. <laughs> um, I, not not in its current guise, I guess. Um, and it's hard to like know how far, f like, from a, I guess, from a central point, like the how far on they got. Ultimately, if you are Kind of coming back to my point earlier, I think the, the, if it's treated as a dependency, then it's it's the same tooling ultimately to see like how compliant your your, your org is, and you shouldn't have that dependent. You shouldn't be depending on that version if you're um, if you're not compliant with the policy. So like I like fail the build ultimately as the team until I until the um, uh, until, and you can be on an old version of the policy. That's okay, so long as the the organisation is kind of happy with with that version kind of and it's within the life cycle of that version and the runtime that you want to run it in so if your production cluster accepts like two and greater then you can work on one but you know that you won't be able to uh, actually deploy it to production you might be able to deploy it to an environment that does accept version one of the policy
So with um, a sort of frequently updated right there policy, do you find, or would you find, do you think, that because um, it's always going to be a factor, everyone's going to be a bit more mindful of it, and um, I guess, excuse this expression, I've just pulled out my ass, it we sort of, policy will kind of be built in from the ground up, from development teams or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, the, that's the, the utopian vision, <laughs> reality of it. We'll, we'll see. But, um, yeah. Um, yeah, it's hard. I guess I say, like, the, the, the bigger challenge is, the, is people. Tech's easy, right? I might, might not be in the right room for that. I'm sure we spend plenty of time looking at code and, and, and struggling, but tech's really easy when you compare it to people. People are really hard, and cultural change is, is super hard to achieve. Um, and that, that's what most of this is. The tech is stuff we already do elsewhere when we build software and we build things that other teams depend on. Like, it's no different. Um, and where would you recommend start with the policy? So closer to lift shape or, oh, sorry, uh, more the, to the left of the developers running the pre-commit hooks and run the policy version of Or you would recommend this start with CI, CD and run there the gates for policy as well. So for the starters, for to even to sell the idea. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, I generally would focus on, uh, like both with this and any other bit of tooling around kind of developer experiences, I would generally steer towards like make the experience good for the developers to start with. Naturally, like developers are all kind of smart people, and if you can articulate the benefits that it provides them, so that they know that they're working in a safe space, uh, and they know they can, it works in a way that they're familiar with, um, then it naturally becomes something that you can run in CI because they'll run that in the same way as they might like run a lint check or run the unit test, right? It's no different to that fundamentally. Um, and it's obviously up to them to kind of run their pipelines and uh, usually and, and for, their, for them to sort out how their application gets built. Um, but yeah, focus on the developer experience first and foremost would be generally my advice with both this and kind of other any sort of other kind of cultural change and make that work really well, get them fully on board with it, um, and naturally they'll, that will kind of filter through to the end. Ultimately, the whole point of a lot of that is is being able to run the checks all locally, rather than, as I said, like just like smashing your head up against when you find that something's not applied properly and you end up with production that's broken, uh, often because the production cluster or production environment, whatever it is, um, is someone said, well, we should have more strict policy there. Developer environments lower down, well, they can run whatever. We can be more relaxed on the policy and, and controls that are on a lower environment and monitoring and anything else. Production has to be kind of higher. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, that's the, that is, I guess, the, the DevOps movement or whatever, but, um, or other similar kind of buzzwords. But um, yeah, like focus on, on that experience. And if you've nailed that, then you shouldn't really see exemptions being raised further up, or exceptions being raised further up and any failures because they've built it right from the ground up and they baked in uh, the understanding of why they're abiding by the policy early on, right? And you've actually articulated to them the reason of, of, of why it's important. Cool. Oh. So, um, you didn't, uh, <coughs> you, you, you exemplified with Kubernetes and you didn't use uh, OPA. What are the shortcomings for OPA in terms of policy? Nothing. I, I, did, I used Caverna. I could have used Keyboard and I could have used. Um, oh, I'm not thinking any of the others. There's millions. I mean, Kubernetes is just too unopinionated as, as all of them. No particular reason for not using OPA um, whatsoever. You could do it in any of them. Um, it was just picking something arbitrarily <laughs> off the, off the, as a thing. Yeah, some tools also has the, the restrictions and the policies, like Terraform recently introduced a uh, uh, check for the variables. Yeah, I had to do weird things for the Terraform of uh, putting the version number of the of the policy that I wanted to use as a variable, and then I have the the uh, my ugly bit of bash uh, look gets the variable number, checks out the version that the policy repo at that tag, and then checks the Terraform against and same thing happens for the Kubernetes and checks it against that. Super ugly, please pull requests. Um, but that that was kind of how I kind of hacked it together to make it work. <laughs> proved a point. It was all kind of proof of kind of concepts and 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 value and right and to make a make a talk that wasn't just PowerPoint. There's something there's some code that runs somewhere. So, uh, so what are the challenges that you see uh, in this uh, policy as a code? 
when there are multiple organizations involved who are contributing to one product. Because no matter how much you talk among each other, uh, at the end of the day, that they are going to do their things separately. And probably when you integrate all of this, there could be like something that gets broken. Okay. Um, is there one org that owns the risk, ultimately? And, and then they're the ones that, that own it and can articulate down. They can delegate down. The, the old line kind of thesis kind of really is, is that is that risk conversation that finds its way ultimately articulated towards some policy. The implementation of the policy could vary between vi uh, different ones, but ultimately your risk owner is going to have some appetite that they can that you need to help them articulate of what they're willing to accept and some principles. So kind of risk of like PII, kind of uh, sorry, personal identifiable information, as a, I mean, gov. So acronyms are common. Um, so if you if your concern is like PII being leaked, that has that's a risk and a problem and a concern. You might your principle might be well we encrypt all PII fine, and then your policy might be that that, that that's defined as like how that is uh, evaluated against in Terraform, and then another one against Q uh, Kubernetes, and another one against uh, a VM somewhere or something else. Um, I didn't. Um, I. <laughs> um, I didn't. Um, however, I can if you if you if you'd like them. Um, they're all open. You can download the ones that are there. Um, but uh, I paid a uh, found a Ukrainian um, uh, graphic artist to do it, um, uh, and they did a terrific job. So more than happy to, to refer on if you if you're interested and, and pass on her details. Um, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Different, right, I guess, but... <laughs> Hello. I'm only asking because I want a t-shirt. I've only got five. I think we've run out already. Um, how do you know you're doing policies as version code correct? What's the success criteria? Like it, with tests, like I know like sure. code analysis, yeah, coverage is good. I have a number. What metrics do you follow? Um, that's a good question. Um, so... Ultimately, like the, knowing the success of like it being uh, adopted by your org, then like look for failures that happen beyond the local development environment. Like back to a point earlier, like nail the developer experience early, shift that all left so that they can have a first class experience of it operating on their developer laptop, and that being the identical result as they get when they try and do a deploy to prod. Right. So you shouldn't have a scenario where you do your deploy to prod and it's um, and it fails, but it passed in earlier environments. If you've done that, then, then something weird has happened along that developer experience and you failed. Fine, that's normal, we do that all, all the time, that's part of the problem. Um, the next bit, I guess, is like the risk owner, whoever that is and wherever it's delegated to, just un understanding and articulating the risk that, it's, that they're signed up to. So if it's been communicated well to them and the, the, the way that the policy is shaped and the risks that that both mitigates and introduces, they understand, then happy days. Um, if, they're, if they're uncomfortable, then you've got a problem. Ultimately, incidents will always happen. Fine, things will always go wrong, fine. But they, the, the risk owner needs to be aware of the, the risk that was, a, that was presented and understand that, that there is a possibility of those incidents. Um, and it's when surprises happen, when they weren't aware, that's where your policy ultimately has failed and your risk management as an organisation has, has kind of failed you. Awesome. Grand. Um, yeah, find me if there's anything else. Um, I'll be obvious from somewhere. But thank you so much for your time.